This is the Los Angeles Unified School District headquarters, also known as LAUSD, which is located in the heart of Los Angeles and is the second largest school district in the nation. LAUSD enrolls more than 640,000 students in kindergarten through 12th grade. The boundaries of LAUSD spread over 720 square miles and include the mega city of Los Angeles, as well as all or parts of 31 smaller municipalities, plus several unincorporated sections of Southern California. Founded in 1853, the district, as it is widely known today, counts more than 115 new schools and campuses. Thanks to the nation's largest public works project, funded by bond measures. Unfortunately, a lot of these new schools are now being the target of charter school operators. Today, most of these charters are independent charter schools run by private operators. I knew there was a lot of propaganda and misinformation and there is a whole force that is promoting charter schools um, and there was not much to counter it. So I had the time and I decided I was going to um, investigate them and start a blog and do what I could. Uh, well, we had had starter sc charter schools start in the 1990s and then um, we had a um, state takeover and we had um, some, uh, the California Department of Education, the state superintendent sent us uh, uh, state administrators who had been trained by the Broad Foundation in their state, in their uh, Broad Superintendents Academy. And we had a series of three of those. And when they came in, they just started, to me, just ripping up the district, at, you know, at bringing in more and more charter schools, closing down schools. You know, the first one had to have a bar bodyguard because he upset the community so much. He had, and um, I just said, this isn't right. And uh, you know, with more and more charter schools coming up, my uh, neighborhood school was losing um, uh, enrollment, and uh, so I just thought that the, you know there was just so there were so many lies associated with these charter schools, of them being superior, and without looking at other factors that were contributing to that. Um, primarily, in the case of the one that I knew about, were um, compliance contracts. So they would force uh, students and parents to sign, and if you're going to require <coughs> a signature of compliance contracts, that's a whole different type what of school. Well, many of these charter schools claim to be public schools. The Labor Relations Board ruled that even though state law describes charter schools as existing within the public school system, as far as federal labor law is concerned, charter schools are now public schools but private corporations. My name is Mary Hill. I'm a teacher at Howard in Oakland. And I've seen, uh, in the time that I've been working in, at, uh, in Oakland, how charter schools have siphoned off a lot of the students who have been attending traditional schools and some who would have attended traditional schools had they not been taken by charter schools. The problem with our charters is that they tend to find ways to weed out students who have behavior issues or academic problems and those... Do you think public money should be going to charters? Oh, no, I actually don't I, I, because a lot of the charters are privately controlled so I don't think that they should be getting public money that could be helping students in our traditional public schools. I'm Carrie Anderson, I teach first grade at New Highland Academy. Uh, I think in the context of today it means clearly defining what public education means um, I'm thinking about uh, Trisha's words a few minutes ago about uh, the deception and blurring the distinction. While in one sense charter schools are public schools, in another sense they're clearly not. Uh, they're not required to serve all students. They're not required to follow all laws that public schools are required to follow. And um, they lack the transparency that true public schools have. So it is not in the best interest of students and families to have that kind of deception. And how have public school students been hurt in Oakland by the opening of all these charter schools? 
The fact that they are able to have a selective enrollment process, they're not obligated to take each and every student that comes to their door, uh, means that they can, to a certain extent, decide which students they're going to serve and which students they're not. Um, particularly special education students are not served fully. Uh, Isn't that the law that they have to be equally served, special education students? I believe it is the law, but I think that um, you know the way that things happen, uh, the way that students are either included or excluded from a school, you have a difference between what uh, people think is happening and what's actually happening. Uh, and certainly when students leave Oakland Public Schools to go to charter schools, the public funding goes with them, and so there's less and less funds available in the public schools. Now, there's efforts like in Los Angeles to make the whole district, Broad Foundation wants to make the whole district charter. You think they would like that in Oakland? If you look at nationally what's happening with privatizing education and the charter movement, um, there are financial interests. People are benefiting financially from it. So uh, within the system uh, where making money and making profits is what we value in this society, you can connect the dots, you know. So you don't think that that should be a part of public education? No. But profit? No. I do not think that profit should be part of public education. No, I don't. And However, there are now over 6,700 charter schools educating roughly about 3 million children in the country. Compared to public schools, charter schools are an extremely unregulated business. They contract with private companies to provide all kinds of services, from curriculum development to landscaping. Most of the regulations that bind charter schools are implemented at the state level. And unlike public institutions, the finances of charter schools are managed on a school-by-school -school basis. They're not consistently held accountable to the public for how they distribute funds. Charter schools are often able to keep their business practice under wraps and thus avoid too much public scrutiny. The growing number of charter schools in different cities is part of a massive national and international organized plan to privatize education. At the national level, there are hundreds of educational foundations sponsored by millionaires such as Bill Gates, Eli Broad, and others. Outsiders such as Iman Fethullah Gulen with over 300 schools in Turkey and over a thousand schools worldwide has also invested heavily in the charter industry in the U.S. Uh, it was an article that popped up about a charter school in Salt Lake City and one of the parents who had sat on the board of that charter who uh, was con had, had, had felt had some things were going on at that school. It's called Beehive um, Science and Technology Academy and um, he was concerned about things that were going on and started looking around and he found out about the Gulen movement and that the people from this group were starting schools around the world and he felt like there was an association between that group and the charter school that he was sitting on the board. When he raised the issue, uh, apparently the board members got, um, the other board members got irate with him and um, he was very alienated, got, he got very alienated and he ended up leaving and pulling his kids out. So anyway, that was one story I encountered and then uh, that, from reading that article, I think reading the comments, I eventually got led to another story that was going on in um, late 2009, I'd say. And the charter school scandal started in May 2010, so I sort of found that story and then I found another story from that about a uh, charter school in Arizona, same thing, a Turkish operated charter school where there were suspicions that there were associations with this um, Turkish religious group. And then I remember thinking to myself, I said, this is odd, we've got Turkish charter school in Salt Lake City, we've got a Turkish charter school in Tucson, Arizona, and Tur Turkish run charter school. And then I thought, gosh, there's a charter school in Oakland that I remember looking at the board listing and not recognizing the nationality of any of those names. And that had been a few years before. So what I did is I went back to um, that school. The one in uh, Arizona is Sonoran Science Academy in, in Tucson. They have several schools in Arizona. So I went back to the one in uh, Oakland, which is Bay Area Technology School, and um, it goes by the name uh, Baytech. 
and looked at the board member listing and these were all Turkish individuals. And I thought, this is really odd. So I started doing some more research and realized that there was, this. so this is in like May of 2010, I realized there were more things about this. And it's been taking a while to sort out kind of the, the correct information from the incorrect information and kind of piece it together. So it's been a full two years since I've been. As a result, charter school operators have infiltrated hundreds of educational institutions at every level of government. Their goal, to turn our education system into a for-profit corporation managed system worth billions of dollars. The House of Representatives recently passed a measure that would hand $300 million worth of taxpayer money over to charter schools. Not only are these schools typically run by corporations that are looking to make a big profit. But... Um, it appears right now that um, the wealthy is going after public education. They're going after public education by privatizing them, pulling the money out of education. A lot of people think it's about the kids, but it's not about the kids. It's, a, it's about the money in public education. And it's also about the views of certain individuals. Uh, right now, according to Diane Ravage, about 80% of our public schools are now segregated. And that's alarming to me someone that grew up in a segregated school. It's, it's disturbing. We don't want to go back to that. And a lot of people will not say it's bad because they haven't lived it. But the people that lived segregation will not want to go back to it. And that's the last thing that I want to see. So, and a lot of parents right now are voting against their own best interest because they're listen, listening to people that are saying, they are going to provide this for their kids and that for their kids, smaller class sizes and what have you. But they aren't providing good education to the kids. They just aren't doing it. I received one kid from a charter school that sat and faced a board. All day, every day he faced a board. And his mom thought it was wrong, but she didn't know until she brought him to the school where I worked. These things are happening. And that's not to say that all charters are bad. There's some good charters around. In fact, teachers created charters because they wanted the autonomy to teach kids a different way. But that's been hijacked. It's been hijacked by the wealthy, and now they are privatizing them. They are segregating them. And I don't know if you've ever been to Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana, but if you ever have an opportunity to get there, go there and you will see the haves and the have nots. You will see segregation, I think at its worst, um, and you will see where this country is headed if it continues to go the way that it's headed right now. Individuals saw opportunities there. They saw opportunities, and I can't think of the name of the individual from in New York, but he put it, probably honest than most. He said they're five billion dollars a year in public education. They may as well get some of that money. And that's what this is all about. They pulled all the money out of housing. You know, the housing market caused the collapse on our economy. And um, now they're looking to do the same with public education. And again, it is not about the kids. This is about the money that can be pulled out of public education. It's about privatizing education, and it's about experimenting with our kids. Well, if they open up a charter school, they get money based up on the enrollment there. Now, the money that comes to them isn't locked in to say, it must go here, it must go there, it must do this. They get so much money per child. They will pay the educators less. They will provide less to the, to the kids and they can get buildings practically free. Uh, and the rest of that money is profit for them. It's a profit for them. And they make very good money doing that. The reality is that a lot of the kids in these um, high poverty neighborhoods are not even allowed to go to those schools. 
they will enroll there. And then as soon as the state test is up on them, the kids are kicked out and they are sent to public schools. And any public school teacher will tell you that just before the state test window opens, they get a lot of kids from charter schools because charter schools do not want them. They will hold them until they can lock in the average daily attendance funds that they get per child, and then they will kick them out. Now, note that they don't generally take kids with uh, individual education plans, the IEPs, special ed. They don't generally take kids. Of the, they take from our public schools the best and the brightest. And then they hold them up to say, look what we've done. Um, that's okay. I, I don't really have a problem with that. My problem is that they don't teach them. They don't advance their education. They hold them up. They tell the parents all their kids will go to college. And now many of the kids are having problems in college because they taught them how to pass a test. They didn't further their education. And that's kind of what's happening right now with a lot of our kids and a lot of the charter schools. In Los Angeles, the charter movement has disproportionately expanded, especially during the last few years. Just recently, the California Charter School Association, CCSA, successfully helped in the election of four out of seven LAUSD board members. Among them, well-known privatizer, and lawyer charter school supporter, Monica Garcia. You want to restore salary? I think salary should be a priority. Year? So you want to help me understand which cuts are you talking? Yes, our employees took multiple years of furlough days. Right, what right. I'm trying to do, Monica, if you look, if you look at all the remuneration our employees have gotten over the last 10 years, we're well behind and I'm saying, Let's just make it a living wage now to work for this district. And I beg to differ, a special ed aid makes about 18,000 to 22. That's too low. Uh, a custodian makes very, very low. Yeah, because some of their take, members make less than that. Well, I, you're absolutely right. And I'm saying, let's look at that. Okay. Let's restore okay. something that's a living wage as opposed to they can go out on, on and, and get government assistance and make more. Monica Garcia is an elected LAUSD school board member for district number two. So congratulations to Camino Nuevo and the entire family. Congratulations, Mr. Mayor, because you have pushed us. Since her election to the board in 2006, Monica has been the champion of the privatization movement in Los Angeles and has been a key symbol in the implementation of more charter schools in LAUSD. Vemos esto y vemos a una presidenta del Board de Educación que creo que es la persona que más odia a su propia comunidad, porque es la que más busca aplastar a su propia comunidad, sabiendo que esta es una posición que ella puede dar muchas, pero muchas cosas buenas para la comunidad. Sin embargo, le gusta esclavizar a la comunidad, que es la señora presidenta, la señora eh, Mónica García. As a leading proponent of charter schools, Monica has been instrumental in handing over more public schools to the charter school industry more than any other board member. En principio no no creo que como padres teníamos una posición clara sobre los charter hasta que vimos de que atrás de toda esa campaña de que las charter tenían mejor educación que las escuelas tradicionales o públicas no estaba basado en elevar los niveles de educación, sino que estaba basado en atraer recursos para que los accionistas de las escuelas charter se llenaran los bolsillos de dinero. El Estado y el Distrito Escolar de Los Ángeles tienen una deuda con las comunidades. Es increíble, pero cuando yo miro la posición de la Secretaria de Educación, Dibai, y miro que en su, en su estado, Chicago, tiene donde la privatización, o sea, el traslado de la educación pública a la educación privada de las charas, deberían de ser el ejemplo de que, han de, de que han crecido en educación. Sin embargo, los niveles educativos de Chicago son los más bajos. 
y ha ido retrasando. Entonces quiero hacer dos énfasis. La educación pública no es mala por sí misma. ¿Quiénes son los responsables de hacer mala la educación pública? Yo creo que allí sí hay que señalar. Y creo que eso tiene que ver con quienes están financiando a los nuevos políticos que están ocupando los puestos en el board de educación. Nuevos políticos, porque son políticos profesionales. Estas personas vienen del sector privado charter, son financiados por las charter. Entonces, ¿qué compromiso tienen con la educación pública? Ellos van a responder a los intereses de aquellos que los están financiando. Entonces, cuando vemos esto y vemos a una presidenta del Board de Educación, que creo que es la persona que más odia a su propia comunidad, porque es la que más busca aplastar a su propia comunidad, sabiendo que esta es una posición que ella puede dar muchas, pero muchas cosas buenas para la comunidad. Sin embargo, le gusta esclavizar a la comunidad que es la señora presidenta, la señora eh, Mónica García. Aparte de todo eso, vemos que hay un escándalo de corrupción, un escándalo eh, eh, que no se ha tomado en consideración y que se está llevando suavemente, como es las graves acusaciones que hay contra el señor Refugio Rodríguez, el board member del Distrito 5, en donde no solamente utilizó dinero para regresárselo a sí mismo, sino que también acusaciones graves de parte de la asociación Char que él coordinaba, donde utilizó a esa asociación Char como parte de su patrimonio personal. Entonces estamos viendo que los, la comunidad involucrada en la educación del Distrito Cual de Los Ángeles no está haciendo nada. Hay una impunidad de parte de aquellos que tienen el poder y el dinero y eso les permite abusar de una forma escandalosa de los padres a los padres los utilizan para llenar requisitos a los padres los utilizan para decir miren los padres participan pero cuando yo estoy yo he sido presidente dos años del de comité más importante yo creo que la señora tiene un problema grave y es que creo que ha leído mucho o ha vivido mucho en el feudalismo donde nosotros los pobres debemos de irle a honrar ya que ella es de la realeza. Esa infraestructura que cuesta miles de millones de dólares que se ha pagado con los impuestos de todo el mundo, esos están siendo traspasados sin ningún costo para el uso y usufruto de las escuelas charter. Los últimos dos miembros del board que fueron electos no fueron electos porque tuvieran experiencia o porque supieran de la educación. Fueron electos porque son expertos en desmantelar las empresas públicas y convertirlas en empresas privadas que le generen lucro, que le genere dinero. Al final de todo, cuando desmantelen el distrito, ellos se van a ir porque no les importa la comunidad. Mi nombre es Robert D. Skills, soy un social justice writer y soy un public education activist. Estamos aquí hoy para anunciar este recall porque el board president, Mónica García, Her policies and her budget priorities are not in line with those of our community. You know, we are seeing hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on testing and evaluation systems that have been discredited in academia. I write with those people, I know. You know we're, we're spending countless of millions of dollars on real estate deals that are unfair for this district. We're giving hundreds of millions of dollars in property away to privately run charter companies. We have a different vision for LAUSD. This board president has consistently ignored the voice of the community, and we want to see money spent on early education centers. We want to see money spent on SRLDP. We want to see all this funding spent on adult ed. Adult ed is only 2% of the budget. Just recently, Monica came out in support of LAUSD board member, candidates, Refugio Rodriguez, Nick Melvoin, and Kelly Gones all well-known charter school endorsed candidates. I have to tell you, you have to remember, I know it's hard. Share your love. You love kids. You see a future where we lead again in this country. It is clear that Monica Garcia has used her so-called love for our kids as a mouthpiece to advance her political agenda. Together, we can transform this district and Los Angeles so that we're leading urban change in this country. And that According to the website bigeducationalape.blogspot.com, in the months leading up to the March 7, 2017, 
LAUSD election, Monica Garcia made some questionable comments about the children that she is supposed to love. For example, she suggested that students requiring special education services are not her own kids, including 12.7% of the LAUSD population. And then in September, she said that our biggest problem is that most of our kids can't read. Our biggest problem is that most of our kids, all of our kids can't read. Our biggest problem is that most of our kids, all of our kids can't read. If that's the case, then Ms. Garcia has little to show for all the years that she spent on the LAUSD school board. However, board member Monica Garcia has been sugarcoating her years of continued failure as a school board member. One of the popular political slogans Monica has used to advance her political agenda is the so-called School Climate Bill of Rights, which reduced suspensions by about 80%. However, teachers feel that the so-called School Climate Bill of Rights has not improved students' discipline, but rather in some places it has worsened. Not only has Monica betrayed the children she is supposed to represent, but she has betrayed the workers who endorsed her school board election. For instance, Monica was against giving a raise to LAUSD aides. If you look, if you look at all the remuneration our employees have gotten over the last 10 years, we're well behind. And I'm saying, let's just make it a living wage now to work for this district. And I beg to differ. A special ed aide makes about 18000 to twenty-two. That's too low. Uh, a custodian makes very, very low. Yeah, because some of we've their taken... members make less than that. Well, I, you're absolutely right. And I'm saying, let's look at that. Okay. Let's restore okay. something that's a living wage as opposed to they can go out on, on and, and get government assistance and make more. Sure, but, but that is, Dr. V, just to be clear, so where you're saying let's restore, that is a pay increase. No, it's not. It's restoring what is old, owed to them, Monica. Okay, so it's restoring I'm not against old. it. Well, I don't know. Just, it sounds like you're against that. I'm not. Well, I want to understand. I want to understand the choices that you are presenting. What I'm hearing you request from staff is not just bring to the board in January a program on this on the technology component, but you're interested in also uh, identifying at what point or the timeline that this district would be able to talk about increasing compensation. No, no, it's not increasing, it's restoring, Monica. That's one. What, what I wanna do is look at the whole amount of money that we're going to take, and then we as a board would set our priorities. I'm not- However, Local 99, the union that represents these school aides and assistants, spent $169,972 for Monica Garcia's school board election. Hi, my name is Courtney Pugh. I'm with SEIU Local 99, and we represent over 45,000 classified school employees, many of which that work for LAUSD. We are strong supporters of Monica Garcia. She is someone that is reflective of the constituency. She is a very, very strong leader, has been there for workers and civil rights and human rights, and we are very, very excited to be with her. Monica Garcia, uh, the school board president, the present school board president that took over for uh, Ref Rodriguez when he was charged by the district attorney and indicted, Monica Garcia is a close uh, associate and friend of Ref Rodriguez. So the Ref Rodriguez gang is, is still in power but now formally headed by Monica Garcia as president of the school board. Uh, Monica Garcia got her start many years ago when she grew up in East Los Angeles. She does come from East LA. She did make connections, but not as a progressive activist. Her institutional and political connections <clears throat> are to the more conservative wing of business administration. And these are the friends and the powerful connections that she has made that boosted her to be elected to the school board about 10 years ago. Since that time, she has uh, extended her <coughs> tentacles, let, let us say, political tentacles, uh, out of the uh, 
uh, through the Democratic Party, but also through conservative groups and, and neoliberal uh, uh, financiers, and she has become a <clears throat> a uh, a puppet, a, a hand puppet for the interests of profiteers on the school board, along with the others. Jose Rodriguez Guzman, I am a founding parent uh, of a uh, whole charter schools here in Los Angeles. Since 1994, I've been uh, a charter school parent. And, you know, at the beginning, it was a beautiful thing, like Karen said. But as soon as I think the school system started noticing that they had the power to do whatever with the money and nobody was questioning them, then I became that parent uh, that they continually tell me via email by the CEO, I have a choice. I have a choice to go anywhere else. So my response to him and my response to anyone else that questions me, because even LAUSC, the charter school division, has questioned me and told me if I don't like it, I have a choice. And my choice is to hold them accountable. I founded those schools in 1994 under the premise that they were going to provide my community in South LA a quality public education, and I'm going to hold them accountable every step of the way with the Brown Act, with, I, I, could, I filed two, uh, two, um, two uniform complaints in 2015 regarding uh, uh, funds, uh, the categorical dollars. To this day, there's still no resolution. I just got an email, for, and I appealed the case, and I'm still more than three or four or five years. We have no idea how the money has been spent. No idea. And the charter schools division right there plainly wrote it in their oversight plan. We're monitoring, we're monitoring. Well, hello, how long are you going to monitor? How long is something going to be done to resolve these issues? Brown Act violations, contact the district attorney too, and the charter school oversight. Oh, we recommend that you do this and we recommend that you do that. Where is the level of transparency? And it's like the gentleman said, I missed his, his name. A lot of parents do not know, a lot of community do not know that we have these rights. They don't understand what charter schools are and it's purposely done that way. So you don't understand, so you don't exercise your right to demand to demand the information in order to get your children educated. And I work at the school, so I see what happens at this, the level of discrimination. I just had to file a, 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 an assessment for a child. Four freaking years this child has been retained. Four years. This child is in the fourth or fifth grade reading at a first grade level. And I know because it happened to me, it happened to my child. I have been bamboozled. My, my child was forced out of the system because of my advocacy. Accused me of restraining orders and threats and crazy things of that nature, but I won't give up. I won't give up because this is my community. And if we give up on education, if we give up on private public education, we are doomed. Correct. We are doomed and we cannot sit idle. And so no matter what happens to me, my child's going to be taken care of, but my community is too. And I don't care if I stand alone and nobody's standing next to me, I'm not going to shut up. And no matter what anybody says or accuses me of, it's going to be democratic, and I'm going to find out, and I'm going to follow the money. I'm Karen Wolf. I'm a parent in Los Angeles. Well, it's been very surprising to me that SEIU has not take, taken a strong stand against charter schools because um, most of their, many of their members are parents in our public schools in LAUSD. Um, and I was at a school board meeting um, in 2013 when there were people lined up around the block when John Daisy was under fire and some of the parents there who were there to try to push Daisy out were shocked to see their own union, SEIU, 
there to support Daisy. And one of them turned to me and said, how did this happen? They didn't ask me. They didn't ask their members. Welcome. Good evening, board. How's everybody? Uh, let me step out of my category of being the president of SEIU Local 99 to say one thing. I'm glad we still have our chief at the helm, uh, Dr. Daisy. That's on a personal level. They've always supported Garcia. They've always supported her. It and makes no sense to for? me. Garcia. She stands for privatizing public education. She's the leader. And now she's the president of the board. <laughs> Voted for by Ref Rodriguez, who is a crook, and he votes for her. Well, why would the SEIU 99 support a candidate who is for charter schools where there, there are no unionized service workers in charter schools? Well, that's coming from a labor perspective, that's a very, very good question. It, it, it is baffling to me. It's completely baffling to me how they justify um, with, with their mission, you know, um, how, how they justify the, their position on charter schools. I mean, there's just no connection whatsoever. They completely conflict with each other. I'll say one thing, I'm glad we still have our chief at the helm, uh, Dr. Daisy. That's on a personal level. Good to see, see you here. Our communities deserve a school system that is truly public and democratically governed by the community they serve. California School Employees Association and I am personally I am against charter schools because they do not allow us to have union at their schools. They are a bunch of thieves. This business for them is just profitable. They uh, force the parents to volunteer at the schools doing our jobs and they if they don't do it then they dismiss the kids. They don't have uh, a record of where the kids are going after they leave their charter schools. And it's um, really a, a very bad situation for the parents and mainly for the students. And of course, for unions. So charter schools are not the best. They haven't proven to be the best over our regular schools and they uh, are cheating, they are stealing, they are using their money uh, at their leisure and they cover up with false documents. So charter schools are bad news and we shouldn't let them do this to us. It's just not fair. Today is the opening of school in Los Angeles for many of the schools and it also is the kickoff for the campaign for a ballot initiative to repeal the law to repeal charter schools and to basically put them out of business. And what we're saying to those charter schools and teachers at charter schools, and some of them have been even organized, at least the teachers, and a couple have, have staff that have been organized, is what we're saying is they need to be put under uh, the umbrella of public uh, uh, regulation. And they, they, we don't want these private boards running charter schools, and we want them to be under the same uh, conditions and same rights. They are able to bring in teachers to teach uh, who are uncredentialed. Uh, they are able to do all kinds of things. They have salaries that was mentioned, high salaries of these executives. 
that is an outrage. These, that money should be going to the students. It should be going to the teachers and the staff, not to these executives who Eli Broad uh, is, is uh, developing all over the country. And as I said, uh, John Deasy, who uh, created havoc everywhere he went, was rewarded for a corruption scandal in Los Angeles to be a trainer, and more supervisors and managers. Now, what kind of uh, person this Eli Broad is, they would put in a crook who steals from the public, and also Apple and Pearson were involved in the corruption, and what we're saying here is the district attorney of Los Angeles and the state attorney, Kamala Harris, should be investigating not just John D.C. and the cronies of his who are involved in corruption and, and, and uh, special contracts. He, they should be investigating Apple and Pearson, and they should make them pay back the money that they took from the students and the public in Los Angeles. That's public money. And what we're saying is there needs to be accountability, and those politicians who are elected to be responsible for enforcing the law need to enforce the law against these people. That's critical. I hired right out of Loyola Marymount University to work for a Green Dot High School that was co-located at an LA Unified School District middle school, which number one was a terrible situation because you had these, you know, it wasn't really a high school campus. They couldn't use the library because they wouldn't bother to pay for it or, you know, they, they it was very alienating to have high school kids on a middle school campus to begin with. It always sets up a problem when you co-locate the charter. And then when she gets there, um, there are no books. <laughs> she taught, um, I think it was three or four preparations. Now a brand new teacher is never supposed to have that many preparations. And I think she might have had more. But they're supposed to have maybe two classes to prepare when you're a new teacher. But she had like five levels of Spanish or something, or four levels of Spanish. So it was an impossible situation. The air conditioning often didn't work. She had kids who needed special ed attention and emotional attention who would just be allowed to wander the school because they didn't have you know, anybody to take care of it. They couldn't pay for a special ed teacher or a counselor. So they would just let um, you know, the kids wander the school with no help. And it was pretty scary. It, you know, it wasn't that anybody was in danger. The, the child was in danger to himself. Um, they, this, I have to say that the principal and vice principal of this school were caring people. They had been um, LAUSD uh, teachers and they actually did care about the students. So they themselves tried to lobby to get some special ed uh, teachers at their school, which I think is unusual. And by the way, they had the lowest scores of all Green Dot schools because their emphasis was on the child and not on scoring, you know, high on tests, which was amazing. Um, but my daughter, it was just pretty impossible and she didn't stay with the school. So do they have a high turnover? As far as I know, they have a high turn turnover at every single one of the charters. Most people, when they get a job with a charter, and she herself, I think, would, would have preferred to work for LA Unified. But there weren't jobs. At the time, you know, when she came into teaching, there just weren't any teaching jobs. They were laying us all off, I think, or many people at the time. So, so there's a teacher shortage now. Do you think that part of that is that teachers are being scapegoated and public workers are being harassed in the schools and a lot of people aren't going to the It has to play a role. I mean, if I were a young person now, I would never go into teaching. I would try to find anything else where I was helping, you know, some kind of, you know, psychologist, something, speech therapist, anything. But to be working for the schools right now where we're blamed for all the problems that kids face, it doesn't make any sense. And what role do you think Eli Broad and his, his foundation have played? Well, Eli Broad has, they've had a plan for quite a long time to be sure to prove that our schools are really bad, they don't serve kids, so they can close them. 
and they're doing this in Chicago right now. There's a, a, 11 parents on a hunger strike trying to keep their high school open in a neighborhood in Chicago, which I think is super. But Chicago is one of the worst. They closed something like 50 schools, I think, last year, or quite a few anyway. And it's all just to give the money to charters. It's not because they need to close schools. They don't. They need the neighborhood schools. And of course, they're destroying neighborhoods. This is the whole point. They import kids from other places to, come, to go to these charters. So there's no sense of community anymore. There's no support from the families. It's become, it's almost as if they really prefer us to be in, in um, you know, in our little rooms on our computers and never interact ever again. But yes, but Eli Broad is, is has, this is his plan. And he said last week he wants to turn 50% of the schools of Los Angeles into charters. And it seems like, the, uh, why don't you talk about DC and what he did to the, Los Angeles school. <laughs> I mean, he has been uh, a as a bright star for the Eli Broad Foundation. Yes. Eli Broad, his wife. I mean, this is the star of one of the stars of their foundation. What has his role been? In, well, in what Los I Angeles found, University? and also what I found horrendous is that the reason why he got his job is because. Eli Broad and others came to the Board of Education in Los Angeles and said, if you take this man as your superintendent, we will give you lots of money. And so they took him. Well, even though Santa Monica had just said he did a terrible job, another district, I believe, in Rhode Island said, it didn't, said we're not going to hire this man. He faked his PhD. He did not even do the work for a PhD, but he calls himself a doctor. How can you how can you hire somebody that dishonest? Well, I knew right away there was something wrong, and I, I started watching what was going on. And immediately I saw if he wanted to pass something at our board meetings, he paid a parent group to, uh, to bring in parents and kids to demonstrate to demonstrate for whatever it was he was putting forward. Well, it was, they didn't have to bribe them, unfortunately. They just said, oh, we'll give you a bus and here's t-shirts to wear. I, I, I mean, that's, you know, these people really thought he was doing them a favor. What was the policy he was trying to pass that day? The C policy. What does that mean? That means that kids have to have a C average in order to, um, to graduate from high school. This is impossible. Even one of our board members said no. She said, I would never be where I am today. I could not get a C in, in algebra. I had to, you know, I, I couldn't have. I wouldn't have been able to graduate. But no, Daisy pushed this policy, but he got a group to come and, you know, go rah-rah for him when it was not a grassroots effort. It was just a group. So this is the kind of thing he did. And then the main thing he did was to intimidate, I think, intimidate administrators, tell administrators to go looking for the oldest teacher in your school and find a way to get rid of them because he had contracts with TFA. He was going to hire Teach for America teachers. That's what he said. It's illegal in so many ways, but you know, you say, oh, well, you said this the other day to a student. And the, the teacher has no, there is no due process for teachers, unfortunately, especially in LA Unified. There may be in other districts, but in LA Unified, no, you're immediately taken from the classroom and put in what they call teacher jail, or now I think you can actually stay home. But often you wait three or four years and then you, you leave because you're so frustrated by the whole process. What charter schools are trying to do is eliminate the teaching profession. Uh, because if you want to make money, the last person you want is someone like me. You don't want a 25-year-old veteran. You don't want award-winning teachers. You don't want teachers at the top of the salary scale because that's a formula to lose money, not make money. You don't want teachers to teach in the system long enough that you qualify for retirement health benefits because that's a fiscal liability, not a fiscal asset, and that doesn't tie into your bottom line. Uh, I think, uh, so, so this is a direct war on teaching and the teaching profession. Uh, I think it's important for parents to understand that if you go, if your children go to a private, to a public school, you have a voice in the running of that school. 
if you believe that uh, your school needs to put more emphasis in science or your school is assigning your children too much homework or too little homework, you go to the principal of that school or the local leadership council and you address those issues and the school is responsible to you. They listen to you uh, and the community. When you have your child at a charter school, uh, they're run by a CEO. And when you walk in with your complaint, whatever it is, the, the, you don't like how the children are being handcuffed to radiators, which is what they were doing in New Orleans. You don't like that the KIPP schools have a padded closet where they lock children in until they uh, urinate over, on themselves because they are so terrified. Uh, there's a KIPP school where they keep changes of clothing for children who are so terrified, they urinate on themselves. If you are upset by any of these kinds of practices, you walk into one of these charter schools and the director says, we're a private company. We, uh, if you don't like our practices, find another school. You have no voice in the running of your child's education. And I don't think most parents are aware of that. Uh, I think that's a very, very important thing for you to understand. I think another thing to understand is school choice is a false choice. Parents do not get to choose their schools. It's the schools that choose the students. And if you have a child who is expensive to educate, uh, those children have a very, um, they're very unlucky when it comes to winning these lotteries that char charter schools administer every year. When you look at uh, school A on one end of the block, they have very low percentages of limited English speaking students, very low percentages of special education students. You look at public school B around the corner and they have two times, three times the number of special ed kids because the charter schools have been dumping those children onto the public schools. So two things are happening. One, the charter school is draining the public schools of public school money, and they are leaving the most expensive children to educate in the public schools. The public schools become a dumping ground with no money. Public education, not privatization. Public education, not privatization. Been down this road. If you remember, we privatized the utility industry and competition supposedly was going to make electricity all but free in this country because of the power of the free market. And what deregulation gave us was Enron. What Enron did was they bankrupted the state of California. Uh, the charter school movement is no different and the, and the arguments being made for free enterprise solving our education problems are the same arguments that were made during the utility deregulation movement. And the effects are going to be the same. We are going to end up with uh, people like Eva Moskowisk of Success Academy in New York who pays herself millions and millions of dollars a year. Uh, they are going to bankrupt public education in this country just the way Enron did. The, the similarities are striking. So I would just ask that you consider some of those things. In California, an appeals court decided a 14-year-old who was thrown out of a charter school for disciplinary reasons wasn't entitled to a hearing to present evidence in his defense, which state law requires for a public school. The House of Representatives recently passed a measure that would hand $300 million worth of taxpayer money over to charter schools. Not only are these schools typically run by corporations that are looking to make a big profit, but they're ripe with fraud. There are charter schools in the county that do not make it through the school year. Napoli Daily News reported that since 2008, 119 charter schools have been closed. 14 of them never even finished their first year. At Taylor International Academy in Southfield, children didn't get to finish last school year. I can't learn anything because they shut down the school. The school ran out of money. It was taxpayers' dollars, and where did it go? Charter schools get paid on a per-student basis. Charter schools fail the test for what constitutes a truly public institution in many ways.
So let's look at the following information about charter schools. Almost all of the ones that I've seen were started by members of the National Education Association. But in the meantime, let's give some background here. Dr. Rodriguez was elected to the school board in uh, 2015, so a couple of years, 20, 2015, a couple of years ago. And then over the summer, he became the president. He was elected president of the school board. And prosecutors are saying that uh, he broke the law in the way that he financed his run for office. He was elected uh, to represent District 5 of the LA Unified, which is an area that stretches from Los Feliz down to Southgate. Investigators with the city's Ethics Commission say Rodriguez laundered campaign money. They accuse him of giving $26,000 to his cousin and then asking her to persuade relatives and friends to give that money back to his campaign. Now, investigators say the cousin got 25 people to do that. Some were people who used to work for the charter school organization that Rodriguez founded. Records show one of them was a janitor there. On his campaign forms, Rodriguez certified under penalty of perjury that his campaign money came from individual donations. But prosecutors say the money really came from Rodriguez himself. He faces felony charges of conspiracy and perjury. If convicted, he could lose his job and spend up to four years uh, behind bars.